On March 17, 2011, in Sacramento, California, a mother woke up on the floor of her living room, dazed and confused, realizing she had just suffered from another episode of an epileptic seizure. After coming around, she discovered her baby daughter lying next to her, unresponsive and badly burned. However, what appeared to be a tragic accident turned into something far more sinister when investigators discovered a melted baby pacifier inside of the home's microwave oven. This soon causes the line between genuine illness and cold-blooded murder to become blurred in the case of Ka Yang. So Ka Yang, who was 29 years old at the time, was born in the United States and is of Hmong descent. She lived in Sacramento with her husband, Chi Lo, their three young sons, at the time were aged 4, 7, and 8, and their daughter Mary Bell, who was born on January 22, 2011, and was barely 6 weeks old. Ka loved her children and took good care of them, and having three boys initially, she was super happy to finally have a daughter, and by the family's account, she loved and cherished Maribel. Chi's brother, Va Lo, also lived with the family, and Ka's mother, Chua Ku Yang, stayed with them periodically. Ka's relatives lived nearby too, so they occasionally helped with the family since Ka had frequent seizures. Ka worked as an office worker while pregnant with Maribel, and after Maribel's birth, she worked at home preparing checks over the internet for a few hours a day. Her husband, Chi, was a long-haul truck driver, and typically he was on the road during the week and at home on the weekends, but at times he would be gone for up to 14 days at a time. So let's get into Ka's medical condition. She began having seizures at the age of 13 or 14, and by the time of Maribel's death, she had experienced more than 100 seizures in her lifetime. She took medication to control her seizures, but she did not believe the medication helped. So according to Ka, during the seizures, she would usually lose consciousness, fall down, and afterwards did not remember what happened. Ka would describe them as beginning with a flash or flashback. She did not know when she was going to have a seizure and had no memory of what happened during her seizures. She would fall from a standing or seated position, her hands would curl up, and her body extremities would shake, her eyes would roll into her head, and she would drool while making moaning or groaning noises. Ka would bite down her own tongue 90% of the time, and sometimes even lost control of her bladder due to the seizures. In her husband's experience, Ka did not walk around or do anything during her seizures, which lasted for at least 2-5 to five minutes. After a seizure, she had very low energy, was slow to get up, and seemed dazed and confused. Normally, she would go somewhere and lie down, and it would take three to four hours to regain her senses. Cho explained that some of Ka's seizures were more intense than others. When Ka would have a fall down seizure, she would fall into the ground, shake, clench both fists, and bite her tongue. These could last up to 10 minutes. When she came to, she would get up after taking a moment. Cho would then help her to the room and she was back to normal after sleeping for 30 to 60 minutes. Other witnesses to Ka's seizures noted that she often appeared weak, confused, disoriented, or exhausted after a seizure. During that time, she could not follow simple commands and she could not complete any complicated tasks such as working on a computer or even driving. She would gradually regain consciousness and her recovery time would depend on the severity of the seizure. One time when paramedics arrived, probably four or five minutes after Ka had a seizure, she was able to answer their questions, but did not understand why the paramedics were there. Ka's sister-in-law once observed her have two seizures that caused her to fall to the ground, clench her fists, and shake for two or three minutes. But she also observed one instance in which Ka was sitting on her couch when her face went blank and she looked dazed for about a minute. When she regained her senses, she did not remember what they were talking about. 
Ka's brother, Kao Yang, also reported that Ka's seizures varied widely. Sometimes her seizures would cause her to fall down and shake, but sometimes he would just kind of blank out for several minutes. This is usually called an absent seizure. During these fast seizures, she would stiffen up and shake, but would not fall down due to how she was positioned on a bed or couch. She would usually get up a minute or so after the seizure was over, but sometimes Kyle would tell her to sit down because she was woozy as she walked like she was not there. And other times she would get up and you just can't really tell how she was. She would not perform any automatic acts. Sometimes she would stay on the couch and sometimes she would walk into the bedroom. It generally took some time before Kyle was conscious and alert again. And in neither instances, she would remember what had happened. So Kyle had been involved in two car crashes due to her seizures. The most recent one occurring only a week before Maribel's death. While driving, she recalled having her usual flashback and then last thing she knew she was awake in the hospital. So at this point, I'm sure you're wondering why I'm going over Ka's medical conditions so extensively, but it will be all more clear as we dive deeper into the death of six-week-old Maribel. The day of March 17, 2011 began normally as any other day for Ka. Chi was out of town working and Chol, her mother, arrived the evening before to help care for Maribel because Ka needed time to apply for public benefits that afternoon. Ka fed Maribel at around 5 a.m. that morning, then assessed the check on the internet for her job at 6 a.m. She and Maribel got out of bed at around 7 and 7.30 a.m., changed her diaper, then handed her off to Chua so that she could go run errands. When Ka returned home, she yelled at the boys to quit playing video games and get ready for school. So that morning was as normal as any other day for Ka and the family. Chua then walked the other two boys to school and gardened in the yard upon returning home. Ka prepared food for her youngest son while he played with Maribel, who was lying on a pillow on the floor. Ka then yelled at him for playing too roughly with the baby and told him to go shower up. After working on her computer for several minutes, she went to check on her youngest son and then yelled at him again for spilling water all over the bathroom after his shower. After his shower, he began playing with Maribel again and she told him to get ready and get dressed for school. Chua then put Maribel in her bouncy chair and cooked breakfast. After a while, Maribel started to cry, so Ka got up and gave her a bottle. Maribel continued to cry, so then Ka gave her a pacifier and Maribel finally fell asleep for a few minutes until waking up and continued to cry again. She was crying more than normal that morning, and Cho said that Maribel was a little fussy, but it did not concern her. So Ka and Chi spoke to each other every day because he was always away driving for work. The day of Maribel's death, Chi caught Ka from the road in the morning during a break and they spoke for around an hour or two, which was not unusual. That morning, Chi reported that Ka didn't ever say that she was stressed, overworked, or frustrated. Ka didn't mention that the baby was crying excessively or otherwise acting strangely, so it just seemed like any other ordinary day for the both of them. At around 2 p.m. now, Chi's brother Va left the house to go pick up the two older sons from school. While leaving the house, Va said he remembered Ka still working at the computer as he left, but he did not remember seeing or hearing Maribel. Computer records show that Ka worked on multiple checks between 1.10 p.m and 1.58 p.m., just around the time Va left to go pick up the boys. After Va left the home, Ka was now alone inside the house with Maribel since her grandma Chua was still gardening in the yard outside. So after Maribel's death, Ka told detectives she gave Maribel a bottle again, and then a pacifier. She noticed Maribel's eyes were moving back and forth like she was looking at a fly, but there was nothing there. Ka said the eye movement without apparent cause scared her a bit, but she did not think anything would happen because of her faith in God. Maribel rejected the pacifier and was crying, so Ka picked her up and held her again, and she finally stopped crying. Soon after, while still holding Maribel in her hands, Ka said her head started pounding, following by a flash of white light or a flashback, and she woke up with Maribel lying next to her in the bedroom she believed she had a seizure because she wet herself and bit her tongue. 
She did not remember anything that had happened during the seizure. She noticed Maribel was red in the face, was still, and was not breathing. Crying, Ka brought Maribel to Chua, who she thought was in the kitchen. When asked why she did not look for Va instead, Ka confirmed that although she did not remember him leaving that day, she remembered him returning to the house after she had found Chua already. And she knew that Va had been away because he always leaves to pick up the boys. After Ka awoke from the seizure, she said that she wanted to find her mom because that's just how she reacted. At that time, Chua was returning to the house from the yard. She testified that when she reached the stoop, Ka opened the door holding Maribel, who wore pajamas and was wrapped in a blanket. Ka said Maribel was sick and that they needed to take her to the hospital. Chua said that Ka's face was flush, her body was sweaty, her pants were wet around her thighs, and her tongue was bitten, so she couldn't speak clearly. Chua unzipped Maribel's pajamas, and she saw that Maribel had burn marks all over her chest, her skin was peeling off her chest, and her body was hot to the touch. When Ka saw, she started to peel off Maribel's skin near the top of the closure of her pajamas, but Chua slapped her hand away, and when Va returned from the house from picking up the boys from school, the front door was open and Ka and Chua were standing about five feet inside the house. Chua was holding Maribel and Ka said something bad happened to the baby and that she might have had a seizure. Ka and Va discussed taking Maribel to the hospital but Chua told him to call 911 which he did at 2.09 p.m. or approximately one to five minutes after he arrived back to the house. On a 911 call, Va repeated what Chua had told him that Ka had a seizure and dropped the baby and probably fell on her. During the call, Ka complied with Va's instructions from the dispatcher to put Maribel on a sofa and to perform mouth to mouth. Ka later told detectives she performed chest compressions on Maribel and Va initially testified to the same thing. First responders arrived at 2.16 p.m. A firefighter and a paramedic entered the house at 2.17 p.m and saw Ka kneeling next to Maribel on the couch. They asked Ka to move out of the way and she complied. One responder asked what happened to Maribel and someone in the room replied, I don't know. Someone said Ka had a seizure and mentioned falling on a space heater. The responder did not formally assess Ka, but nothing he observed from his limited interaction with her suggested that she had suffered from a seizure. Firefighter and emergency medical staff testified that Ka said she had a seizure while working on a computer and she dropped Mary Bell onto a heater. One of the medics was told by a family member that Ka had a seizure and fell against the heater. Later, an officer interviewed the medic at the scene and she said that Ka told her over and over that she had a seizure and she did not know what happened. Ka was calm, alert, standing, talking, and making eye contact. She did not appear to be confused or disoriented to the medic. Both the fireman and the medic did acknowledge they breached protocol for treating a person who reported experiencing a seizure by failing to assess Ka's medical condition, prepare a patient care report for her, or offer to transfer her to the hospital. Police officers then arrived at 2.23 p.m., at which time Maribel was already pronounced dead. Ka told the officer what she did that day before her seizure, that she had a history of seizures and that she believed she had a seizure at approximately 1.30 p.m., but that she could not remember what happened. She did not appear disoriented and appeared to understand and appropriately respond to his questions. She appeared fairly calm and did not appear weak. The officer testified that it was possible her calm demeanor was due to shock. He did not check her clothing for incontinence, but he did not smell any urine. So now let's get into what actually happened to Maribel. Maribel died of thermal injuries resulting from overexposure to microwave radiation in a microwave oven. She had second and third degree burns on approximately 50% of her body and suffered severe internal burns. The burn patterns were consistent with burns from a microwave oven and suggested that Ka placed Maribel in the oven lengthwise and on her back. A microwave oven expert estimated that Maribel was in the oven for over two to three minutes at minimum. 
and although an exact estimate was impossible, his best estimate was at least five minutes. It would take two to three minutes in the microwave oven to cause the injuries that killed Mary Bell, but the resulting burns would have taken longer. The expert witness demonstrated how to use Ka's microwave. So to cook for five minutes, the user must press the buttons five, zero, zero, and then start in order. Nothing happens only if the start button is pressed. Pressing the five and the start buttons causes the oven to cook for five seconds. Pressing the button at a minute once cooks for one minute and each additional impression adds another minute to the cooking time. Pressing the bake potato button twice and then pressing the start button will also cause the microwave to cook for five minutes. So this is how her specific microwave worked. Since there are so many different microwaves out there with different features, this was important information to know due to the argument of someone who had just had a seizure wouldn't be able to perform this specific task to use this microwave. So after trial, the jury found Ka guilty of first degree murder and assault on a child resulting in death. The jury found true to the allegation that Ka personally used a deadly and dangerous weapon, a microwave oven, in a connection with the murder charge. The trial court denied Ka's motion for a new trial and sentenced her to 25 years to life in prison on court one plus one year for the weapon use enhancement. So before we end, let's get into two of the main theories or arguments in the trial. One of the arguments was, of course, Ka's seizures being the cause of microwaving poor Mary Bell in the oven. Could her seizures and being confused after cause her to do that? Some facts we know is that she was usually too confused to perform simple tasks and always needed rest after her seizures to be consciously alert and oriented again. And the postpartum depression was ruled out in court due to the experts saying that uh, with depression, usually you would see a lot of signs and symptoms. And the way Ka described everything, she didn't seem like she suffered from postpartum psychosis, which again, experts say that it's pretty severe and you usually would be able to tell with signs and symptoms, but they couldn't find anything like that. So it was ruled out. And so we will never know why she did what she did to Maribel with the microwave. But I do want to say that postpartum depression after having a baby is real. And a lot of time it goes unnoticed because people fail to see it or they don't professionally get medically diagnosed or in certain cultures, it just gets pushed under the rug and it could possibly turn to something tragic like this case right here. So we're going to end with that. And let me know what you guys think about this case. Do you think it was due to her seizures? Do you think it was because of her postpartum depression or psychosis? And leave your comments down below and let me know. And you guys have a safe night. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.